Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video I'm going to show you how you can run c -sharp code in your .NET application with that c -sharp code living somewhere else before it has even started yet. Now this approach is pretty niche and fairly advanced, however, you can achieve some spectacular things with this, especially when it comes down to metrics and logging, but also some other stuff depending on how far your imagination can go. This is a technique that every cloud provider like AWS or Azure is using to inject stuff into your .NET applications when they're running in the cloud, and I think it's a really valuable feature to know. If you like that of content and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe or ring the notification bell, and for more training, check out nickchapsas.com. Now, super quickly, before I move on, I want to remind you that I'm running my two-day in-person workshop from Zero to Hero, Effective Testing in c -sharp. in a bunch of conferences this year. For now, it's NDC London, .NET Days in Romania, NDC Oslo, and NDC Porto with NDC Copenhagen, and a few others to be announced. In that two-day workshop, I'm starting you from the basics of unit testing, going into some more advanced stuff, then looking into some mutation testing, and then the next day, we're looking into integration testing, and then topping it all off with performance testing. It's a very exciting two days, setting the right foundation for your knowledge in testing in .NET. And if you want to join me, NDC is actually giving away a free ticket so check that link in the description to see how you can sign up for any of the upcoming NDCs and I hope to see you there. All right so let me show you what I have here. I have a simple weather API and it has the controller and it has everything that you might have seen from the box standard weather API and if I just quickly run this API to see that it's just the vanilla experience I can go here and just say run this request and as you can see I'm getting the weather back. So exactly what you'd expect from the template. And we're going to use that as basis to demonstrate the feature. Now, the feature is pretty simple and it delivers to the following promise. What if I want something to happen before my application even starts? Imagine you deploy your application somewhere and that environment wants to also run some code with your code when it's starting. For example, let's say that in your company, you have standardized ways for collecting things like the CPU that is being used, the RAM that's being used, garbage collection invocations on the different generations. Let's say you want to collect all of those metrics for your application, but you don't want to have it in each application. You want to have it in a single library, and then that library is injected on every service as they're starting. That's what we will achieve with this feature, and the feature is called .NET Startup Hooks. So as the name implies, we are hooking some code in during application startup. And that's exactly what companies like Azure or AWS use when you deploy your .NET application let's say in a Lambda or an Azure function or in a web application to be able to capture your logs and collect your metrics. Okay, but how does that work? Well, first that code has to live in a separate library. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new class library here and I'm going to call that sample hook and that's it. And then I'm going to delete this class one and I'm going to create a new class here called startup hook. But this one will be internal. And it also will have no namespace. That is important. If you have a namespace, this will not work. I'm going to go ahead just quickly and disable this once with a comment here. And now that I have that, I'm going to go ahead and say public static void initialize. And now in here, any code I put will run with my application as it starts. For example, I can say console.writeline started from hook. And that's it. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to publish it. So I'm going to say publish into a local folder. And then I'm just going to say delete existing files. So I get new ones every time. And then the thing will run. And now I get a path to this DLL over here. I don't know if you can see it. Here you go. I get this path. Now, all I need to do to inject that code into my application is set a single environment variable. So let me go to the terminal just for better visibility. So if I just do .NET run here, as you can see, the application is starting. I don't see anything printed. But if I stop it clear and I go and I set the environment variable with name .NET startup hooks with an S, and that is important because you can actually have many of those separated by a semicolon in Windows or by a colon in Linux, then if I set that and I say that's where my hooks are in this environment, then every .NET application that runs in this environment will load those hooks. And in this case, .NET run, which will do build and the application running, so I expect it to see it twice, will print started from hook for the build and then started from hook for the application itself. Now, of course, you might not want to have it run for every .NET application. So what we can do is just set it to nothing on this level and then go over here and copy this and go to the launch settings 
and not the parameter here to make it easier for me to demonstrate the feature without having those DLLs being hooked into everything. So if I do that and I set the value here now, and then I go back to the terminal, now if I do .NET run, I'm not getting the static from hook on the build because the thing only hooked on the .NET application itself, the thing I'm running, the API. And now I can do magic. What do I mean by that? Well, the most common use case is you want to collect data for this application as it is running. So what you might have is something like this. So what I have here is a simple metrics collector class in my hook that all it really does is starts a thread with this infinite loop that every two seconds collects the times that garbage collection has occurred on a specific generation of objects and then it prints it in the console. Now it could be pushing it into something like CloudWatch or Datadog, but in this case, I'm just gonna print them in the console. And you can go as far as you want with this, but just to demonstrate how this works, I'm gonna leave this as it is, quickly publish this back into that folder, and then I'm gonna go in my application and just to trigger some garbage collections, I'm gonna change this weather thing to generate anything between 200,000 and 500,000 weathers, but only return a slice. I'm going to say to array and then take five and return that to an array again. So this will just generate a bunch of objects that need to be garbage collected. And for this to actually start, I have to trigger it. So I'm going to say static read only um, metrics collector collector, and I'm going to initialize it here. So collector equals this. This can't be read only fair, but it can be static. Here we go. And then with that, I'm going to quickly republish this. And I'm going to go and run my application. So I'm going to say .NET run over here. And now, as you can see, every two seconds, I've injected that code. And in my application, the same application that is running, we also print the garbage collection generations. So if I now go into the weather HTTP and I call that, and I go ahead and I start spamming it with some control alt F5 over here, this generates tons of objects and only prints five every time. So I'm going to just do this for, for a little bit. I feel like a DJ. <laughs> and then I'm going to go back to the terminal. And as you can see, we had garbage collections on every generation. And if I go even further over here, we're going to start seeing more and more and more. We're going to just spam it for a bit. And as you can see, now we have more over here. And this is something you can totally push into other services. The biggest problem is you can't really have dependencies or new packages directly added in this hook. They just won't be loaded. I think there is a story that is tracking this issue, but there is actually a workaround, which I'm going to show you too in this video. And to demonstrate it, I'm going to use the following premise. Let's say you have console printing for everything that's happening with my application over here, but you want it to be redirected on a file when someone is pushing the code in a specific environment, or you want it to be in both, both in the file and a console. So you want to inject an extra thing into the logging. Well, you can with this, but because we're going to be using Serilog, which is a third party logging provider, and that is a new good package, which is really, really tricky to add directly into the hook itself. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and create a new class library, and I'm going to call that hook a proxy or whatever you wanted. But basically, that's where all the logic will really be in that class library. And then our sample hook will load that class library. So we're going to add a dependency or a reference to the hook proxy from the hook. And then I'm going to move something like the metrics collector over there. But then the problem with this is that if I actually go here and I try to publish my code base, the new sample hook, and yes, delete everything that was there before, then as you can see, if I do a .NET run now, this won't really work. To make this work, we actually need to write an assembly load context, which is very, very simple. All we need to say is something like hook assembly load context over here, and this class will extend the assembly load context. And we need two things. First, we need an assembly dependency resolver, which we will initialize here in the constructor. So I'm just going to say new resolver, and then I'm going to use the assembly class and say get executing assembly and then dot location to get the location. And then we just need to override the load method over here, the one with the assembly name. And the code is here is very simple. You try to resolve the assembly path based on the assembly name. If you found something, then load that assembly from that path. If not, return null. That's it. And then in the hook itself, in the startup hook, you want to have the load context over here. Then you want to load the assembly from the assembly name. And the assembly name in this case is the library's name. So in our case is hook proxy. That's what we're loading in here. And then since this metric collection class lives in that other class, I'm going to just quickly remove it from here. And what I'm going to say is assembly.createInstance. And I'm going to create an instance 
by the matrix collector name. So hook proxy dot matrix collector. So this goes here and this goes here. And now if I go ahead and I publish the hook that is dynamically loading that assembly in, then as you can see, I can go here, say .NET run, and now it all works just like that. Every two seconds, we're getting those generations printed in the console. So now we can work and all our code can go into the hook proxy and we can add packages. So what I'm going to do here is not touch this metric spoiler, but instead I'm going to go ahead and create a log writer. Here we go. And we need this because we're going to need a text writer. We're going to implement all the missing members. The encoding in our case will be the default. Let's just leave it there. And we're going to override two methods. The write method that uses just a character over here and then override the write method that uses a string, those two. Let's just quickly clear both of them. Now, this one, the write that writes the character will just call the string one. So I'm going to say value dot to string over here. And this is where all our logic goes. But this logic will be use the serilog logger to write something in whichever sync we chose. The sync we will choose here is the file system. So serilog dot file. I'm going to add this new git package over here. And in the hook proxy, I'm going to create another class called log redirector. Here we go. And that's what we ultimately will initialize. And in here in the constructor, I'm going to say log, which is coming from serilog, logger equals new log configuration. I'm going to specify the minimum level I care for. Maybe let's say debug or information. I don't know. Let's say debug. And then write to and since we have a file sync, now I can say write to a file and the name I want is logs weather API dot txt, maybe. And I'm going to say that the rolling interval for this is a day. So every day basically have a new file so I can separate my logs based on the date. And then all I'm going to say is create logger. That's it. And now since this will be what we initialize, this can be used in here. And I'm going to say logger dot log. And I can do tricky stuff if I wanted to detect what type of log it is. But for demonstration purposes, I'm just going to say information. So just write the value down as information. But realistically, you would want to carry over what that log level was. I just don't want to go too deep into this. A serial log video is coming. This is just for demo purposes. And now that we have that, all I'm going to say is in my log redirector, set out. So set the output of the console to that new log writer. And that's it. Now in my hook, all I need to say is copy this. So in case you want to grab the code and play around with it, initialize a log redirector. Now, before I can successfully build this and run it, there's one more thing I need to do. I will publish it as it is over here. And as you can see, we will get this new publish folder. However, if you remember, we are pointing in the non published directory. And there's a difference because if I go and I show you the directories, the release directory over here does not include libraries like serilog or serilog.file, which are libraries we will be using, but the system doesn't really know where they are and how to load them. The published directory, however, does have them. So what we will do is change this to now load our hook from the published directory. And ultimately, that's what you should be doing. You should be pointing to a published version so you can actually load all the dependencies that you need. And now that we have that, I'm going to go back to the terminal and say .NET run. And as you can see now, started from hook, but nothing in the console. That is because, and if I just quickly stop the application, that is because now our logs are redirected here. And that's it. Obviously, they have these symbols for coloring and you can go ahead and format them in a different way if you need to. But all the logs now from the console are redirected and you didn't have to have this logic in your application. And of course, this does mean that if you want to configure other things into your hook, like a shutdown event when your application actually shuts down, you can say appconfig.current domain and say process exit and then simply add that event here and say console.writeline shutdown from hook. And if I quickly just republish this and I go to the console and I clear this and I run it again, you don't see anything in here because all of that is redirected. But if I shut it down, you will see now in the logs over here that they have the shutdown from hook logged here in place. It is a super exciting feature and how much you can use it really depends on what you are doing in your day to day job. But I think every .NET developer should know how this works because even on a purely academic level, this knowledge is pretty valuable to understand the entry points of your applications. Now, there are a few more limitations and things like trimming can actually affect the usability of the feature, but I trust you to do further research if you actually need to use this in your applications. I think it's a super interesting feature that has been there for a long time. I think .NET 
Core 2.2 or so. So many years. But what do you think? Did you know about this feature and would you ever use it? Leave a comment down below and let me know. Well, that's all I had for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching. Special thanks to my Patreons for making videos possible. If you want to support me as well, you're going to find the link in the description down below. Leave a like if you like this video. Subscribe for more content like this and ring the bell as well. And I'll see you in the next video. Keep coding.